Hey, PJ, how are you, sir? I'm all right. How are you, buddy? I'm well. I decided I would beat you to it because you usually say, well, hello there. And I don't get a chance hello to be there. the first to say something. So uh, you, look, you look a little blurry today. Are you OK? You look a little faded. That's, right. you, that's, you know? my, that's my normal state. I'm Is that right? slightly out of focus. Yes. <laughs> Is that right? Maybe yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's my glasses. I mean, you seem a little bit more out of focus than usual. Um, uh, uh, well, what do you think, Leslie? He looks a little out of focus. Is that just me? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. All right, PJ. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm sorry I can't be as sharp as you guys. Jeez. Well, what can I say? I mean, uh, it takes uh, it takes a lot of effort to be this sharp. You know, mm. uh, <laughs> not quite as sharp as Leslie, but but sharp. I was actually going to go in a totally different place. I was going to ask you if you're afraid of rattlesnakes. That's where I was going to start, but then you looked faded, so I went there. But are you afraid of rattlesnakes? Uh, when they're not next to me, no. When you're not okay. Well, you know what? I was I was just reading a story today in the paper about a man in Arizona who heard some rustling in his garage and turned out he had 20 rattlesnakes nope. in his garage. Whoa. 20, not one, not 10, 20 rattlesnakes. I, I would probably have to move. Well, I, I think I'd say, have to move. You know what you call 20 rattlesnakes in the garage? What the do you call it? The homeowners. The what? The new homeowners. They oh, is that right? That, I, I agree. Absolutely. I, I call that a 25% discount on the value of the house. That's... <laughs> yeah, or more. Yeah. Right. yeah. You don't have any rattlesnakes oh. around you, do you, Leslie? No, fortunately. I mean, I am in Florida, though, so you mm. never know. I know. You got falling got... iguanas. You got all kinds of problems. Yeah, we got all types. But I'm in a condo building, so I'm hoping that, uh, right, <laughs> that they don't make yeah. their way up the the, the pipes. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I did find in my garage just a couple months ago a very, very large, very, very poisonous frog, and it scared the daylights out of me. The daylight's wow. out of me. I, I mean, I'm talking, this thing was uh, six inches long, maybe. I mean, that's a that's a big-ass frog. A frog? Yeah. Wow. That's... A frog, yeah. And <laughs> and I didn't even know that it was poisonous until a neighbor of mine said one of those in the neighborhood had been run over by a car, and he said, watch it, because these things can kill your dog. And hmm. on that happy note, PJ, shall we introduce <laughs> our guest? <laughs> Frogs and, and snakes and... Uh... Oh my. All right. Sorry people. So, yes. And so look, I, I'm actually very excited to uh, talk with our guest today, Miss Leslie Yvonne Hunter. Uh, she is an entrepreneur and influencer, certified professional resume writer, uh, fantastic career that she's, she's been doing there. And also president of resume makeover, a business that she had founded, which helps thousands of individuals and businesses with their copywriting resume, talent acquisition and career training needs. Leslie has hosted numerous resume and career related workshops with universities as well as groups, as well as with groups, including the Women's Media Group and the Chicago Urban League, yay Chicago, where she has assisted youth and underserved communities to improve their writing communication skills and succeed in the job market. She also recently launched an interview series called Ask the Hiring Manager, which is designed to help job applicants understand how hiring managers think. Beyond her entrepreneurial journey, Leslie is a woman of many talents, uh, classically trained in piano since the age of four. Leslie studied music in college at Illinois Wesleyan University, which I've actually visited Oh, yeah, uh, back in my college days, uh, where she was awarded a piano performance scholarship. Were you there trying to date someone? Is that what it was about, PJ? I was actually there with uh, a friend of mine who was dating someone there. So oh, I got you. Mm. But not oh, your friend. You were not the dater. <laughs> I was, no, I was, uh, you had a friend. I was, I was my normal state as the third wheel. Uh, <laughs> so uh, she she went there. She was awarded a piano performance scholarship, and though she ultimately received a degree in economics, she is fluent in French and Italian, and of course English as well. She's been an actor, a voiceover artist, a writer in Los Angeles, hosted and produced a talk show. Leslie on the town, which she later turned into a blog. Leslie has also been a model, having won the title of Miss U.S. Missouri in 2009 and Mrs. Florida in 2021. And that's Miss and Mrs. So <laughs> lots of different pageants out there. We're going to have to learn a little bit more about that. Miss Leslie Hunter or Mrs. Leslie. Leslie. It's, an <laughs> <laughs> it's just what do you want to be known here. as. Just tell <laughs> yeah. us. Leslie it's works just fine. It's <laughs> So great that you're on the Braving Business Podcast with us. With us, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, man. If I need a PR person, you, I know who to call. You guys make me sound so good. 
Well, there you go. We're, that's that's one of our skills. That's one of the things we bring here at the business, uh, the Braving Business Podcast. And it, it, it helps a lot that our guests are incredibly accomplished. And all we got to do is actually just read, <laughs> which PJ does very well. You read extremely well. Uh, uh, your education. Yeah. That's true. You do stumble over a lot of words. I, I didn't <laughs> want to say that. I wanted you to say that. Um, but, but Leslie, let's, uh, let's talk about you. You're, uh, you're a fascinating person. I've, I've known you a few years and, uh, uh, and I learn new things about you every, every time I, for example, had no idea you were a classically trained pianist, Oh my God! Um, didn't which, stop. which reminds me of a terrible joke, which I will not tell. I will not tell it. Do not ask. I will not. Um, yeah, bring but, that up um, not. what, well, I, you know, I, I don't think I could tell that joke. I, I really don't. I think it would be like one of these jokes. We'd absolutely have to edit out. I, I could uh, try. I, what do you think? Uh, I kind of want to hear it. No, I, yeah, you kind of want to hear it. Yeah, don't do show it. Do it. Uh, uh, all right, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and tell the joke. I, I it's a little racy, um, <laughs> but it's not terrible. All right, so um, this guy walks into a bar, and he sees on on the bar a a very small man playing a very small piano, and um, he's just absolutely mesmerized. He's amazed, right? And um, he uh, he asked the bartender, "What's with what's with the?" What's with the tiny man playing the piano there in the corner of the bar? And uh, the bartender says, well, you know what? It's, it's a really funny story, actually. A genie revealed herself to me, and she asked me what I wanted. Unfortunately, the genie was a little hard of hearing, and I ended up getting an eight-inch pianist. So there you go. <laughs> Will we be editing um, this out? I, possibly, right? I, I don't know. I love it, but you know, yeah, <laughs> it was what good. You guys want to do? Whatever. That's yeah. just like saying, uh, you know, hey, two drums and a cymbal fall off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys, uh, I'll be looking forward to your stand-up routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I just flew in. And from you'll be the only one. I'm retired. Yeah. <laughs> um, all week. right. So, so back to question number one. We've still not gotten to question number one. And question number one is, uh, given your background, classic piano, winning beauty pageants, you've uh, done incredible things with uh, your resume business which I have firsthand experience with. I actually work with you. Um, tell, tell me how, you know, this very diverse background of yours uh, impacts you as a human being and as a, as an entrepreneur. Absolutely. Um, it impacts me, you know, uh, around the board, I would say. And as you mentioned, I do have very diverse background and all of these aspects uh, contributed to who I am today. So including professionally in terms of piano, I'll, I'll focus on that for a minute because that really taught me more than, some may think in terms of um, how to handle certain things in life and in business. So, you know, in terms of my background, um, as kind of mentioned, I went to school, I studied it even before that. Uh, as you mentioned, I was classically trained since age four. So from a very young age. So I was very consistent with my piano training through grade school, high school, obviously on the college. Uh, when I was 18, I qualified and competed in something called the World Piano Competition, which was, which was pretty huge. And uh, so with all of these music related activities, I learned a few things. Number one was discipline um, to be successful in classical music and to be a proficient player of music. You know, a person has to be regimented and devote a certain amount of hours to their craft on an almost daily, if not daily basis. So in college, for example, even at the bachelor level, level I strive to dedicate, you know, three to five hours of practice daily. And that was just practice room time that wasn't including you know, course study uh, for music classes and other classes. So discipline for sure. Um, and that transferred to other areas of my life, business and uh, other things, which I love to do, like working out and such, you know. Um, focus was uh, another key uh, skill I learned. You know, quantity of time helps when it comes to music practice. If you practice for 30 minutes, it can be effective. However, you're likely going to achieve more uh, with an hour and a half uh, and practice time. But quantity is important. However, quality even more so, which relates to focus. So it's super imperative to focus intently on learning new music, music to improve it, to be a strong performer. Um, and that related uh, a lot to other areas of my life, including business, even with you know focusing on resume projects um, and things of that sort. Um, another thing music taught me was perseverance, uh, learning how to move forward and keep going. The music examples I give are, you know, as you would know, Tal, because I know you, you're, you, you know, Tal's probably humble, but <laughs> he's an amazing singer and was a child, you know, performer as well. So you would know this for sure, which is, you know, learning how to keep moving forward, even if you make a little blip, um, being a great performer, you have to keep going. You can't let the, the, the challenge or the mistake keep you down. And that definitely applies with 
entrepreneurial, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit. So let, you know, let me let me interrupt yeah. you just to uh, just to touch on that point because yeah. uh, because it's an underappreciated point I think certainly in performing arts but it's an underappreciated period. A lot of the time you make a mistake and you know it because you've practiced a piece or you've practiced a speech or you've practiced a pitch a hundred times and you know exactly what you were supposed to say and how it was supposed to sound and it didn't come across that way and you hear it and you overreact uh, because a lot of times mm -hmm. the people in the audience, whether it's in a recital or in a, or in a boardroom, uh, don't have the point of reference you have about what should have been done or should have been said. Uh, and you tend to um, psych yourself out of, of of being able to just maintain the performance. So I can speak to that firsthand as someone that has sung and as someone that has uh, blown a song here or there <laughs> or uh, in the boardroom. Um, and it, it took a while to realize no one really heard what you heard. Um, <laughs> and so, so I, true. I concur with you, Les. I mean, I think that that's, that's exactly right. Um, you, you just need to keep on going. Um, you know, I was, gonna, I was actually going to ask both of you about that yeah. because you're talking about high pressure, right? You're, you're talking about performing something that you know, like the back of your hand, it's probably wrote at that point, but you're. You have the added pressure, even though, even, you know, I've done a, a bit of acting myself, right? So I know that you can, you can kind of uh, not really see the crowd in front of you. You can, you can, you know, not get too wrapped up into that and you can get in your own little quiet space and do what you need to do. But when you, when you falter for whatever reason, pitch is wrong, you hit the wrong key, you, you say the wrong word in the song. I don't know. Like, I don't know if you've done that, but what's the, What's the best way to get out of that? Like, you, you know that you, you like the crowd really doesn't matter or not that it doesn't matter, that they haven't really brought on to, to what the issue was, right? They don't know the, the falter that you did. So what do you tell yourself inside to, to ensure that you feel comfortable moving forward without that being a, a pivotal point where you're going to castigate yourself later right because like sometimes people get off stage and like oh my god i i said the wrong thing i'm a failure but it isn't a failure you just did a great thing no one knows that 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 happened right so like how do you how do you do how do you work through that yeah. I'll, i guess i'll go first and i'm curious to tell say too so for me like with your question on you know what do you tell yourself my uh, i honestly and and i know playing an instrument even though voice is an instrument it's obviously different uh, playing a piano versus singing. However, um, for me, uh, honestly, if I can just keep going, I'll keep going. If it was uh, a glitch to where technically my fingers off placement or whatnot, I'll maybe go back uh, a measure, you know, a musical measure, um, or go back to a point to where I feel comfortable picking up. But the bottom line is to keep going um, and to mentally not let it overtake me. When you mention um, PJ about, you know, maybe some people, whether speaking or anything else, leaving the stage, definitely don't do that. I mean, I know it happens sometimes, but uh, I feel like, like you said, most of the time people may not know for um, a classical music is extremely strict and regimented and, you know, pieces that have gone on hundreds of years. So people may know in that case, but the key is to just keep going. And, and uh, I think it's more of a defeat giving up completely versus handling a mistake and just keep, keep it, keep, keeping it moving. So to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I would concur. And I would say that that, you know, uh, is a perfect, um, perfect analogy to what we recommend people do in business. Um, there is inevitably going to be moments where your fingers slip and, and you don't hit the right note. Um, and you can castigate yourself. Like you said, PJ, uh, you can walk off the stage, um, you know, uh, believing that you've lost, or you could just carry on with confidence, knowing that, first of all, you're human. And the fact that you made a mistake is just part of being human. Second, in almost every instance, by far, the person that is most mindful of that mistake is you. Mm -hmm. Most people are, frankly, very self-absorbed. I'm not saying that negatively. I'm just saying it <laughs> factually. And uh, to the extent they're paying attention, they're still not going to have the same uh, level of appreciation for detail 
that you may have, whether you're a performer or like I said, someone presenting a pitch at a boardroom. So I, I would, uh, that would be my advice. No, no, that's I good. So, you know, be kind to yourself, basically. Give yeah, yourself- be kind to yourself. And as, as Tal said, you know, people usually aren't being quite as attentive as, of course, the performer or the person or the boardroom executive or whatnot. So by, you know, by maybe saying things, and I've, I've seen this throughout others too, I have a uh, master's too, and sometimes in my master's program that I was in where people would do presentations, we all would make mistakes. I remember, you know, a colleague, she really stumbled a lot and then was saying, oh my gosh, sorry, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. That brings more to uh, the crowd's attention than has, you know, maybe pausing, taking a little reset and keep keeping them moving. I mean, think about it. If you're kind of a little zoned out as a, <laughs> as an audience uh, observer, um, you know, you, you won't notice someone makes a little blip and keeps going as much as if they say, oh my God, I'm sorry. Oh my God, I messed up. And, and you know, they're, they're, that's bringing more attention to, to, to the by, by the way, speak, speaking of that point, um, I, I have read somewhere and I wish I had the point of reference, but we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Cause I want to make sure that uh, if my, if my facts are wrong, we'll correct it, but I believe my facts are right. The women tend to be more apologetic. Women say, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot more than men. So true. Um, as as so you help true. candidates who are, you know, uh, positioning themselves for an interview for a job or, or uh, you know, in the job fair, do you have any advice on that point? What would you say to someone listening that perhaps maybe even mindlessly apologizes too much? Right. Um, th- and that, thank you, Tal, for bringing that up. I literally was talking uh, about a similar topic the other day with someone. It is, especially for women, I have to say, based on the stats, um, don't, I mean, I, I hate to say it this way, but don't, or, or be mindful, be aware of how much you apologize. Of course, it's great for males and females to be, uh, courteous and, and thoughtful and, and have decorum, but, um, be mindful about how much you apologize. You, especially with executive roles and higher level roles, you don't want that to be sign of lack of confidence and fairness. I used to, I used to apologize so much when I was younger, a lot. And, you know, I thought it was my way of being nice, but there's a fine balance between being courteous and polite and coming across as, I hate to say this, but weak. So um, just be mindful of how much you apologize. Maybe think of another way to, instead of saying, sorry, maybe another way. I know I apologize is similar, but I feel like it 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 takes away a, a little bit of that. Ooh, <laughs> that person said sorry, Mark. I, I was dealing with. Um, I have an executive that I, I'm working with now who is absolutely phenomenal, and a um, career services team that I partner with, and I do resume writing for them. I was uh, I was talking with one of my colleagues from that that uh, company, and this client, uh, without saying her name, of course, is. A phenomenal. She's been on, um, she's a, a Yale graduate. She has done amazing things, led uh, for National Academy of Medicine, done all these publications, just a, an amazing person. And she had asked my colleague, oh, do you think I'll be qualified for this board? And my colleague and I were like, what? And even though it wasn't an apology reference, it's that 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 related to, she's uh, a woman, she's done, oh my gosh, like, um, uh, you know, maybe two or three times as much of uh, uh, older executive males in her field, yet she's she she's not low in confidence, but she's still wondering, uh, am I qualified? My colleague, who's another female, said, it's funny because a male that's done like one tenth of what she did, did would be like, I can do this and I'm going to be great right. at it, you know? So so it is that interesting. I, I don't doubt term. that that could be true. I, I do want to say that, you know, we've had... Um, some no offense wonderful to guys, by guests. the way. No, no, no. It's not a matter of offense. And you don't, don't, you don't need to apologize, See? Leslie. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to point out that we had, uh, you know, uh, earlier in one of our earlier episodes, we had Francisco Sanchez, who was the Undersecretary of Commerce for President Obama. And at, and prior to that, he was a special uh, advisor uh, to President Clinton. And he spoke about feeling, uh, have, feeling the imposter syndrome uh, when mm. he would come into the president's conference room in, in the morning to, to sit down uh, as part of the senior staff meeting, that in the earlier days, he almost looked around expecting to be tossed out by the Secret Service because he didn't feel like he belonged. I mean, I think, look, imposter syndrome and not feeling confident is universal. I would still say, sure. though, and I, I, that it is likely uh, a fact that women 
right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, that it, it tends to, at least uh, from what I've read, be something that women are more uh, likely to experience. And of course, it also, I think, goes even further than that. I think that there is also a potentially a standard that women are held to um, that frankly is unfair and that, and, mm. and that men don't face. So um, yeah. don't want to make this about uh, gender, but I, but I, I think reality <laughs> I is- I could talk forever of, about it, but well, I- Well, look, it's yeah. part of life. It's part yeah. of life and it, it's part of business. Uh, and we, we and, and look to the extent you have anything further to say on that, do you think matters? I mean, given what you do, I think it is really important uh, to to speak about the things that uh, you know that are holding people back. And if, if you feel that, I mean, you know, again, you're you're in the business of helping people get hired. Um, what what do you feel? I mean, is there a higher barrier uh, that a woman faces? And what would you what would again? What would you coach uh, a woman who maybe in her own mind? right, wrong, or indifferent in her own mind questions whether she fits. What advice would you give her? Maybe what advice did you give this candidate uh, after she asked this question? Absolutely. What advice? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I said, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you're qualified. Um, I mean, it, it yeah. So I, I absolutely said, absolutely. You're qualified. And, and um, I actually said she inspired me because she did. She's done amazing things. Um, I do think uh, when you were asking, do I feel that there's uh, like maybe more barriers for women in a certain regard or maybe expectations? Yay and nay. S- self-imposed and, uh, and self-imposed and otherwise. So from, from within good, and from that's without. That's a good point. Thank you for saying yeah. self-imposed and otherwise. I, I feel like self-imposed, yes. And I'll say that, you know, even from my vantage point, you know, as a, as a woman as well, I think... Um, that myself and uh, uh, many other women have felt that, you know, we have to work harder because we're a woman. And then, of course, that could, I'm, and I happen to be a woman uh, and a woman of color. So, of course, you add the the, woman of, uh, the color uh, aspect. And But yes, I, I feel that women that I've talked to, especially um, that are high achieving, and particularly those in male-dominated spheres, such as those in finance, uh, the executive that I, I'm working with that I mentioned that is in the sciences. These are still male dominated. Um, nothing wrong with that. But I think that uh, that really causes women in those fields to think I need to work harder. I need to set myself apart. So, yes, self-imposed. Absolutely. In terms of the hiring process, I feel like nowadays there is actually an advantage um, if, a, you know, if a woman is, you know, uh, equally of course, more qualified because of diversity. In the case of the ex- uh, executive, I was dealing with with boards, uh, particularly, and I don't know if you all know about California and some of the mandates to where uh, boards in California can only have a, I don't want to say the exact wrong thing. I used to live there. So um, not a certain quota in terms of males, for sure. I don't know if it had to do with white males or not, but males for sure, because uh, even my my better half is an older white guy. And I, you know, he was applying for a board and, and when we lived in California and, um, and, you know, at the time he was almost going to, to get the position. And then there was that mandate in place that said, oh, unfortunately we have a certain quota of the, the white males we need to expand. So the part of me as a woman of color was like, yay. But then the part of me that was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm married to a white male. It's like, no, you know, so there, but, but getting back on track. So there are certain uh, mandates and uh, certain initiatives that uh, corporations are trying to have to where there is actually an advantage for a qualified women and people of color, just throwing that in there uh, to Mm -hmm. advance. So I feel like the, um, I feel like a lot of times it is more self-imposed from my opinion as, as women to, to sometimes think we're not good enough or think, okay, I'm a powerful woman, but I need to tone it down because I don't want to come across as too quote unquote aggressive, you know, whereas Mm. a male can do the same thing and just not be considered aggressive or domineering. That's just what guys do. So I I really do feel that I personally think it's great to have masculine and feminine qualities being a woman in business, but I do wish that more women would be less apologetic and just own what they have and not question it. Did that answer your question? It absolutely did. Great. Yeah, that I was... can talk forever. I can talk forever. So. <laughs> well, I mean, you're you are uh, you're talking about some really important 
uh, you know, things that are going on in society today and you're addressing them from an excellent point of view and, and I, I enjoyed it. So thank you. And, and honestly, and I, I think that's yeah. great. I mean, I think, you know, talking about these things candidly, I think is, uh, is a good yeah. thing. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have been someone that has had significant impact actually in uh, working with universities and underserved communities, which I think is amazing. And um, you know, you're, you're basically trying to help them, navigate the job market. You did this, especially during COVID times, which everyone would like to forget, but we were all, um, from your experience in that, could you share some of the moments where these workshops, you know, really brought to light the impact that you were having on people's lives? Absolutely. Um, you know, some examples in this, you know, even, even pre pandemic, um, you know, I've worked with a few uh, nonprofits. Uh, one is called the Chicago Urban League, based out of Chicago. PJ, are you? Do you I've are you from Chicago? Yep. Okay, because I heard you earlier say uh, like, "Hey, Chicago" or something, and I love Chicago. I, I used to live there, and it's a it's a great city. So yay! Um, but yes, the the Chicago Urban League is a nonprofit that works to achieve equity for Black families and communities um, through social and economic empowerment objectives. So. You know, I I led some workshops um, with the Chicago Urban League. A colleague that I went to high school with actually uh, had uh, was working with that organization and knew what I did and said, Leslie, can you come in and lead a resume workshop for these kids, uh, oftentimes these high, high schoolers? And so I did. And, you know, I've led workshops for, you know, I think mentioned uh, what you guys mentioned in my bio, universities and other, other entities with, I mean, amazing uh, individuals. However, it's really groups like the Chicago Urban League that really touch me more deeply because these underserved communities, they oftentimes don't have role models. Oftentimes their family members, their parents may have not uh, gone to college, some usually not graduated, if even have attended college, uh, maybe uh, some will have their GEDs. And so when I was going in to work with these kids, to me, it was more than just how do you write an objective statement or, or, or how, what's, what should you put on a resume? It was that those components, but it was also in a way serving as a role model for them, you know, really encouraging them to uh, pursue their further goals um, ac uh, academically uh, to stay on the right path, uh, to go on towards college. Um, and, you know, they're looking at me as well, who looks like them, you know, um, and who is also, um, you know, an, an educated, uh, accomplished black woman. And so it, it gives them like inspiration, like, oh, that's great. They're, they're hearing it from someone who has gone on and done good things with their life. So that really touches me, you know, because it's more than just the technicalities of how to write a good resume, what to do, but it's really inspiring them. So that was one group I really enjoyed working with. Another is 826 LA, um, and by the name, you can imagine it's based out of LA. When, and I lived in Los Angeles as well. And so um, this uh, nonprofit helps youth with their writing and expository skills. So I would also go in, uh, particularly to the, some of the schools in LA. Um, the schools that I did some of these workshops in were primarily you know, Hispanic, um, Latino communities. And I also love, I mean, by the way, I love working with kids of all backgrounds, but it's really interesting though, seeing different minority groups and, uh, you know, general, I guess, consistencies uh, that that we see in some of these groups. And so with uh, the primarily like Hispanic kids I worked with when I was kind of helping craft, helping craft their resumes and a lot of these, some were high schoolers, some were even middle schoolers. So they, especially the middle schools had a, a long way to go, you know, before they got into the job market, but even still preparing their uh, resumes for internships. I was trying to draw out, okay, what what skills can we draw out because they're 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 kids or they're young people um, in terms of targeting these internships. So some of these kids would say to me, oh, you know, I've never worked, you know, and so I would try to say, okay, well, what do you like doing for fun? And I would chuckle a little bit because in the same breath as some of these kids saying, oh, I've never worked, uh, one uh, one said. I've never worked, but I have helped my dad with his construction company since I was like, I'll just throw something mm. out like 10. And I hope I'm not getting in trouble with labor loss here. <laughs> but but when they would tell me that, I don't said, name the dad's company. I think he might. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Ex 
exactly. So they were like, well, I've never worked, but I've like helped my you know, dad with all these things with his business. And I'm like, uh, let's write that down. That's like work. And another um, uh, young person was like, well, yeah, on the weekends, I play in the mariachi band and we do this. And so, and so it was really interesting seeing these hardworking kids that, you know, they, they and, and, you know, as of course, as youth of any background, you just don't know. So it's part of that just being, being young. But figuring out with the, like helping them to say, oh yeah, you you've done these things. Let's put that on your resume, you know. So that was kind of something that made me laughing. Like, oh, I've never worked, but yeah, you know, for the last <laughs> for the last six years, I've been you know cranking every weekend doing basically what we were. Well, doing you know, you know what's it, it's it's interesting because we're in in effect what you're talking about uh, is self worth or being able to value yes. yourself appropriately and say, well, Mike, I have this experience, this experience has merit and 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 I, I want to claim credit for that. Uh, one of the interesting things you shared with us, you, you told us a funny story in the pre-interview about uh, setting your initial pricing. Um, yes. And it's not exactly apples to apples, but the gist is, again, valuing yourself and being able to determine that's so true what what you're worth. Uh, if you don't mind sharing the story and uh, you know what what did it teach you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a great like segue into that because it's definitely related. So you know, when I was um, first starting out in the new space, and it's kind of also, uh, we'll go into the story, but it also touches on my credibility too. You know, you're trying to build credibility when in a new space. So I had the network of people, um, but le leveraging network is a whole different ball game, of course, you know, and then um, getting that experience that I needed, um, you know, and so as a result of that, so in the beginning, I would, you know, compared to now, of course, uh, charge less naturally to get the experience, uh, experience, sometimes do some gratis projects, you know, just to be able to say to someone, I've had experience doing this and to get my feet wet. However, there's always limits and boundaries. So very earlier on uh, with running my business, when I was trying to figure out pricing, a client had said to, uh, you know, a new client had said, oh, what do you charge for, you know, resume resume revamp at that time i quoted him a price because honestly i was trying to to figure out you know what the best thing i'm not going to say what that price is <laughs> however <laughs> i don't want people being like i heard that you you know right. so um but uh, uh i did and and you know what the client responded saying oh that's cheap and you know what I learned a valuable lesson from that point on. I knew never to charge that low, you know, even in the beginning, um, you know, and I, I get it. It's a journey we all go through. I, I feel like as entrepreneurs who hasn't gone through that, trying to figure out where you stand price wise, but I really thank that client. I actually thank that client, whether he knows it or not for saying that, because that gave me the realization uh, of, of exactly what he was thinking, which may resonate with what other clients think. I feel like oftentimes, even myself, if somebody quotes something to me, and even in my head, if I say, oh, wow, that's like super great, maybe even lower than I thought, I, I, I just don't say it out loud because, of course, you know, I'm just whatever, you know, <laughs> I'm taking that price and, and that's what they're comfortable with. So I really appreciate that client for uh, being outspoken. And, you know, that that also kind of ties back to knowing your worth, as you mentioned. Um, it's, it's a journey, especially in the entrepreneurial process. Um, however, you know, not just knowing your worth, um, you know, as that saying goes, you, you, you and, get and I'll what say, you I'll say this. I'll say this to the guests, uh, I mean, yes. to the uh, to the audience. I think it's worth also reflecting on if you're on the other side of that. So this particular client was on the other side of that. I don't know that he intended to uh, give you uh, feedback that you ended up using the way that you did. But if you're on the sure. other side of that and there's a, as a uh, young entrepreneur or a starting out entrepreneur and they're quoting you a price, to provide a service that you know is just not reasonable uh, for the effort. Um, I mean, at a minimum, I think it would be generous of you to tell them that. Um, yeah. You could say, look, that's a great price and I really appreciate it and that's great and you're hired. But just FYI, you know, I think, let's see how you do, but I think that you know, going forward, you might be able to charge a little bit more for that uh, or maybe even take out the a little. Uh, it's, it's a generous thing to do. Um, you know, I, I understand we're all looking to get some, some, some value, but if you're feeling that... Uh, that someone's being taken advantage of, then the right thing to do is to uh, speak up and do the right thing. I appreciate you saying that. I have, yeah. I do, and I agree. And I, you know, and I, I, I totally agree. I've actually, you know, in the beginning stages of my business, but after that point, 
I did uh, talk with um, someone who was also in the resume writing business that did say it's, it to me as well. You might want to consider raising your prices, you know, um, and then myself now being a, at that time, that's been years back now. And um, there was a, uh, a young lady that I mentor now that's in the resume writing space. And I tell her the same thing. I said, I know you're trying to appeal to a certain, you know, uh, demographic, um, However, I said she also works with executives and also works with other levels. So for her non-executive level, she's working with a certain group economically. And, and I get that. Now for executives, she's done a span of everybody. And I told her, I said, you know, executives can pay. Don't, you know, don't, you, 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 I said, it's your business. I don't want to tell you what to do, but because she does come to me for mentorship specifically, I say, don't be afraid to raise your prices because I know her quality stop. So I do agree with you, Tal, on that. Yeah. It's, it's also a perception for the buyer, right? If, yes. if you are, cause I know that price is such a, when, when I owned my blue jean company, price was always a, a major consideration, right? Like, oh my gosh, I want to, I want to be able to reach the masses and not be too expensive. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make up uh profit on volume instead of each individual piece. I don't need to put my kids through, you know, through school with one pair of jeans. Um, and, but then I, I talked to a, a, um, a consultant, much like a mentor, and she was like, you need to raise the price of Ooh. your jeans. And I was like, well, you know, because I want to do this and da, da, da. She's like, no, raise it. And I did. And I tripled my sales. Right. Wow. And it's because people have a, a, a perception about what they're paying for. If it's, if it's a little bit more expensive, then they're expecting more of a quality. Right. And, and a little bit more of a brand that has longevity. So for, for those in the audience who are considering what levels to put your pricing at, don't undercut yourself. Right. Cause just like Les was saying, it's super, super important to know what your worth is, know what your market is obviously, uh, but know what your worth is and price accordingly, because, you know, you don't want to price yourself out, but you also don't want to, to kind of hamstring yourself on your growth. So it's a, it's an important, it, it helps to do research, of, obviously. I mean, yeah, you know, yes. in, in reality, there's data out there, especially in this day and age with AI uh, that, that can help you land closer to where, where, where the, the sweet spot is. Yes. Uh, and, and like Leslie said, and I, I, I agree. I think when you're young and you're just getting started and young doesn't have to be by age, it could just be your business is young. Yep. Um, Sometimes you you do need to uh, take a couple of deals, mainly for being able to add maybe a brand uh, sure. to the list of brands you've worked with. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not what we're talking about. I do think that if you consistently underprice, I think you're going to have the exact outcome, PJ, that you just spoke of, which is people will believe that your value is less. Yeah. Um, it's a very fine line. It's a very fine line. Um, but it's surprising how many entrepreneurs fall on the wrong side of it and end up not succeeding, not because they can't generate attention and business, but because they're just not charging enough. So mm. something interesting to think about. Um, let's shift to um, the pandemic, because in addition to the workshops you did in the pandemic, I know that resume makeover really had to change. I mean, you were, you were focusing on a particular kind of client. And of course, uh, during the pandemic, healthcare related roles became much more uh, in, 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 fashion, if you will, for hiring purposes. Um, first of all, I had I have to think that making any kind of a pivot is scary, right? So you, you had it to shift, you had a you had a business model that was working, uh, the business was growing, and then all of a sudden, you know, obviously all of us ran into a bunch of unexpected uh, headwind approaching COVID. But when you're an entrepreneur, that headwind can actually knock you out of business. So what type of, you know, first of all, how did you manage yourself? This is a time of uncertainty and fear. Uh, what, what, how did you feel during this time and how did you process those feelings? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, uh, let me answer that from both like what I did in terms of what I could control business wise, and then definitely, um, feeling wise too. So obviously, as we all know, the pandemic was a challenging time for most businesses, millions of workers were laid off. Um, and, you know, with layoffs and less jobs available, this obviously meant less need for resume writers. So business initially dropped dramatically um, from my business was, was at a standstill. So I had to think of creative ways to stay afloat 
and generate business. Um, you know, I think you mentioned I pivoted, you know, my business to cater to those changing demands. So, you know, one way in which I tried to offset the plunge in business was uh, like tar targeting healthcare. Um, you know, during that time, obviously the need for healthcare positions, particularly nurses, went up. So, um, when I did have a spike in business, it was typically from healthcare workers and nurses. So I really tried to, to target and tap into that market. So I would follow up with some past clients, you know, um, kindly ask for their referrals for people they know were getting back into um, that sector or, or asked to come back to the hospitals. Um, you know, I would at that time offer, you know, reduced pricing discounts, so to say, to healthcare workers due to that need, you know, which helped bring more business in for me as well. So um, this helps some of that offset of, of revenue. Um, other ways in which I tried to like manage my business efforts were to, um, you know, lead more resume and career related workshops, especially those that were paid um, through th throughout that time. So one uh, group that I led a workshop for was called the Women's Media Group. It's a New York City based nonprofit association of women who have achieved, I mean, prominence in the, the many fields of media. These women are powerhouses. So you know, but during the pandemic, they were facing challenges as well, um, especially on how to reinvent their resumes and all of that. So I helped lead a career and resume workshop to help answer their quest questions, strategize with these prominent women on how to effectively brand themselves content-wise and resume-wise towards newer different opportunities. Also led some workshops for universities, including Bon Bon University based out of St. Louis. So these 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 workshops really helped um, um, in addition to targeting those healthcare workers and segment of business. Um, and, you know, I would say on a personal level uh, to stay motivated, you know, I gave, I gave myself pep talks uh, for lack of better words. Like I can, I, I normally don't swear, but I can, can you I swear? You can swear. It's a podcast. <laughs> I, mean, I, didn't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I already thought... talked about the eight inch pianist. I mean, they can't get any worse, right? <laughs> yeah, I can't. Exactly. It's not even like the worst or whatever. But yeah, I personally told myself I was the shit. I know it sounds a little, but I, I just, you know, that, that positive self-talk, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, talking about uh, how you, how you talk to yourself and talk to other people, um, you had, you put a quote by the wonderful Miss Maya Angelou about how people remember you not by not necessarily what you do, but how you make them feel. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's so, uh, it's just su such a correct quote of hers, you know, like just so human. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how this principle has guided your approach, uh, throughout your business and life? Absolutely. By the way, love a huge hand of my Angelo, what, like she's one of my role models. Um, so yes, the, the, the quote, by my Angelou, and you basically said it, but it's like, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. And I, that's absolutely true, in my opinion, that the underlying principle or message of this quote um, is, is how I lead my life in general, or at least try to, both in business and in my personal you know, relationships. And it goes back to empathy, it goes back to being a good listener. Um, and in fact, it, it made me think of another related quote. There's a book I've been reading. I don't know if you all have read it. It's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. a great book. I'm like, you know, I still have a ways to go, but I think I'm like 60 pages in or so. There's a quote that he mentions, like, seek first to understand then to be understood. And that both that quote and the Maya Angelou quote are relate to me. Sometimes people are in such a hurry to state what they want, say how they feel, but I think it's better to listen, to get to know the other person, truly uh, show caring as that's what will, you know, that that will endear them to you and you'll be able to hear them from a more empathetic standpoint and to create that empathy and that genuine bond. So people like to be heard, people like to be treated well. Um, and I always believe this, but, you know, it was emphasized to me even more so through what we all experienced during the, during the pandemic. So show care and kindness because it, it definitely matters. 
Well, speaking of care and kindness, um, there's also a very fun side to you, uh, which I've had the pleasure of experiencing. I've, I've had the pleasure of going out with Leslie and her husband. Uh, and they're a very fun couple, I got to tell you. In fact, we had a we, we went to a Mardi Gras party uh, oh, one yeah. time and, uh, and they were they were decked to the nines. I mean, I showed up. I didn't have a mask. I didn't have anything. They were they were ready. Um, so it's a lot of fun. But, you know, I I I love to add a little you know, humanity. Uh, and you've told a really funny story about playing the piano upside down. And you also have this really weird connection with some <laughs> chess grandmasters. Tell our audience about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so the piano, playing piano upside down part, um, you know, it, it, that's it. It's fun little quirk. Basically, you know, I, my level of playing not upside down is advanced. The piece I play on uh, the piano is just like a you know intermediate beginner to intermediate song but i just was one day i was like under the piano and i dropped something and i don't remember who who i was around at the time but they said oh that'd be kind of funny if you could like play something upside down so then i tried and i was like you know what i think i can do this but i have to cross my hands so i, I started like experimenting and i was like you know what yeah Jay, what, what can I you can. do upside down Say that I'm again. Curious. I'm asking PJ what he can do upside down. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> I'm not sure. That'll, that'll be post, post show talk. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I actually struggle, and this is a true story. Uh, when I look in the mirror, my glasses, for some reason, are oftentimes slightly skewed. I don't know why that is. And every time I see them, I reach to correct them, and I always pull them the wrong way. So I always make them more skewed. So uh, <laughs> the fact that you can play the piano upside down is amazing. Talk about the chess grandmaster. Yeah, so that's really fascinating. So, you know, um, chess-wise, I uh, learned how to play chess when I was young, but it wasn't like wasn't with chess what I was with piano. I just knew how to play. Um, my favorite like elementary school math teacher taught me how to play. We would play on like recess time. It was great. And so didn't really do much with it. And then during the pandemic, that show Queen's Gambit, you know, I don't know if you all have seen oh, it. Of oh course. my God. I was just talking about, I literally was talking about it yesterday. Oh my God. With someone great. who loved that show. Oh my God, who doesn't Iron. love that show? I feel like everyone <laughs> I've talked to is like loves that show. And, and that was the reason how I got more interested in getting back into chess. And then around that time, I would start researching like grandmasters and how many grandmasters are there? How many black grandmasters are there? And in the world, there were only, in terms of black grandmasters, only three documented black grandmasters. And one of them I started reading about, whose name is Pontus Carlson. I would go... Um, uh, online, I found it really fascinating because uh, Pontus um, is born in Colombian, uh, born in Colombia, the country, was adopted by a Swedish family. And now he's in his, I think, later 30s. So at the time when he was, you know, a kid, and I don't know how the population of Sweden is now, but at that time, really, you didn't really have <laughs> many, if at all, any Black people. So, you know, he encountered a lot of um, racism and be he became very good at chess at a very young age. And so I was reading kind of about his, his, the challenges he had with combating some racism during that time and being such a strong chess player. And I was like, I wonder if this guy's on social media. So I literally just uh, sent him a message on Facebook and was like, you don't know me, but your story like fascinates me. And I just like starting to get back into chess and blah, blah, blah. Well, it was very late. I'm a night owl, my time zone. And so in Sweden, it was like in the morning and he was up he messaged me back within like 20 minutes and we just like were chatting it all, you know, just chatting a bunch. And he was asking me, what do I do? You know, what's my interest in chess, et cetera. And, you know, he, what I really liked about him is even achieving this great level in chess. He was so humble and just so like relatable and had an actual genuine interest in what it is that I did. And so when I was finished talking about what I did and and there was overlap because he works with a lot of kids as well. And he has a great foundation called Bis Business Meets Chess and Kids, I believe that's what it's called. And um, he does great things where he partners up like business people that help to fund and sponsor these kids in low income areas, especially a lot in Africa that have amazing skills, but just need that backing. So um, uh, me and him became friends and then through 
uh, his foundation, they were having an online tournament and I like donated some money to support the cause. And the commentator at that event was Maurice Ashley, who for those chess lovers may know that he is the first, Maurice is the first black grandmaster in the world. And he is from Jamaica originally. And he saw like my donation because it went across the screen. And I think I tagged uh, him and some other people in one of my posts. And he commented back saying, oh, thank you so much for supporting the cause. And he also was like, what's your interest in chess? And, you know, and so, well, I found out he lived in uh, South Florida uh, where I live. Um, and so we linked up. He invited me to like a chess event uh, as one as his guest. And then I got to meet like other grandmasters, including Magnus Carlsen, who's the world champion in chess. So out of the blue, within like weeks, I ended up like, I, I say, I guess, thanks, universe, God, whatever you want to call it, like manifesting these amazing chess grandmasters. Well, I, I'll tell you who you should think. I'll tell you who yes. you should think yourself. And the reason oh. you should think yourself is because you had the courage Thank to you. reach out. A lot of people simply don't. And, uh, you know, here's another, I think, useful bit of advice that I would give uh, people in the audience. I'm full of advice today, PJ. I don't know what that's all about. I don't know. <laughs> um, it, it is be bold, reach out to people. Uh, you'd be amazed. A lot of people that have uh, uh, been successful in life are eager uh, to connect and give back. And sir, sure, you're gonna you're gonna run into some people that will ignore you, and that's okay. Sure. That's on them, not on you. Yeah. Uh, but but being bold, yeah, it's their <laughs> loss exactly. Um, reaching out and um, asking for an opportunity to meet them or learn from them, um, if that's what you're looking for, um, you'd be surprised how often you're gonna get the outcome that you're looking for. So I think you owe it to yourself because you had the courage. I think a lot of people simply Thank would you. psych themselves out. You didn't. And that's, uh, that's your credit. Thank uh, you. I am not shy. I will approach any. You are not shy. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great point, Tal, because I mean, everyone's just a person, right? It doesn't matter what their, what their station is in life. And so, yeah, you can be awestruck or you can be somewhat intimidated by a person's title or what they've accomplished in life or whatnot. But at the end of the day, they're still just a person. So yes. I've always, I've always just gone ahead and, and reached out to people and, and chatted with them. And, and just like Leslie did, it's wonderful. I love it's, it. Uh, so before we wrap up, actually, I have a, I have a question that we ask all of, yeah. all of our guests. I also have a question. I just want to ask you specifically, and then I have a comment to the both of you. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, the question, That's a lot of stuff, PJ, I'm going to try to keep all that in my head. All right. <laughs> all right. Trust me, I'm going to mess it up. Uh, <laughs> So the first question is, you know, you've considering your journey and and the courage you've shown and the resilience and the perseverance that you've shown and we've talked about, what is one key message or a piece of advice that you would like to share with our listeners about overcoming setbacks or facing adversity adversity? Absolutely. Well, you know, and I may answer this in twofold too. Um, one thing is, you know, positive self-talk and that's through any stage of life that can come in to play with adversity. I know I mentioned earlier that I um, sometimes say to myself, you know, or tell myself I'm the shit. And I want to elaborate on that, you know, as not being apologetic. However, I think that I want to, I want to elaborate what that really means. Um, it, you know, I think that generally I don't believe in submitting to defeat. And I think that others should, should, I think it would be great to have that mindset. Um, I try not to let negative thoughts consume me or influence me too much during difficult times. We can all soak, sulk, we're all human, but just trying to not stay in that space. So, you know, and I really believe in the self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, it's real. So if you tell yourself I'm worthless, I'm not good enough, I'm going to fail, whether in life, love or business, and guess what? You'll actualize that. So I'm the shit became a go-to phrase with several others for myself. I just started talking positively to myself and I recommend others doing this. So tell yourself you're the shit. Tell yourself you're gonna get over whatever the hump is, kick some, since I can cuss, ass. Tell yourself that you're the only one standing in your way. No one can keep you down, that you're a goddess or a warrior or whatever. It may sound egotistical, but honestly, tell yourself whatever you need to do to get out of that miserable self-loathing state that you're in. Um, you know, when you look at yourself in the mirror and hype yourself up, it it may seem silly, but but when you say something a bunch of times, whether it's positive or negative, you start to believe it. So tell yourself good stuff. Um, you know, your thoughts truly create your reality. I'm a firm believer of that. So 
That would be another thing. Also being open to change, knowing that things won't happen in terms of overcoming like adversity and, and challenges, you know, things won't come immediately um, all the time, especially when we're hitting a bump. So just being patient, um, having that resilience, knowing that it will come, just keep not only talking to yourself positively, but actively do other ways, actively doing things to keeping the momentum going forward and being creative, um, you know, will, will, will really help, I think, to push people forward. So that's awesome. And that's, yeah. our, that's our next, uh, t-shirt. I'm the shit. I, I, <laughs> I, like that. I, I love I, it. Actually, no, no kidding. I really do like I, that. I, 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 I mean, I, you, you could say whatever you want. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I talk a lot in the podcast about positive self-talk. Because we tend to be our, by far, our harshest critics. Absolutely. Uh, we tend to be um, consistently uh, unkind to ourselves. And we don't appreciate the impact of that is uh, profound. Um, it's exactly right. Leslie's exactly right. You tell your, your brain is a muscle, like any other muscle. Mm. And uh, you need curls in positivity, just like you do if you're trying to get your bicep to grow. Um, and your brain will learn the habits you're trying to teach it if you're consistent with it and being consistently positive, especially in the face of setbacks is critical. It's as important as almost anything else you do in many ways, more important because it's, it's how you get yourself in the frame of mind to find solutions to problems and get yourself moving forward again. That's our, totally. yet another t-shirt. Your brain is a muscle. You need curls and positivity. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Oh, you are, you are like, how big of a bowl of Wheaties did you have this morning? This is, uh, who me? Yeah. You, <laughs> are. You're, you got some sage stuff going on here. Thank you. Um, That's very kind of you. Of course. Uh, second question for our wonderful guest. What is your favorite classical piece to play? Ooh. Which is one that was the hardest for you to learn? Ooh, okay. So my absolute favorite piece, I literally posted something on my social media the other day, is um, I love Frédéric Chopin. And his, specifically, I love playing his Nocturne in C sharp minor. For anyone that's seen the movie The Pianist, it was played quite often throughout that movie. Um, and even though it was a sad movie, that song, uh, it just touches me. So, you know, if you don't know exactly how it sounds, look, at <laughs> Google it, uh, Chopin's Nocturne in C sharp uh, minor. I usually post it. Uh, so, you know, for, for those that uh, want to find me on social media, I will, you know, probably will be on my page. <laughs> Yes. So, and then in terms uh, I of can play happy birthday on a piano. Happy birthday. Yes. That's I can not play bad. You know? That's I'm not bad. I'm uh, taught to myself version of Pachelbel's Canon. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Oh, great. That's good. That's good. It's good wedding. You know, great, like, right. Wedding, wedding music. <laughs> so what was the hardest one? Yeah. You know, I'm trying to think. Um, on and off. That's really tough. Well, yeah. Rachmaninoff has some very tough pieces. That is very tough. There was a... Because every, well, not every, but um, I would say there is a, um, there are several Chopin, I love Chopin. So there's several Chopin etudes and, oh, I'm trying to remember the Opus 10 number four. I know you guys won't know what I'm talking about, but there was a very fast one. And um, I think it was Opus number four. That was uh, just a beast to, to work through. So Chopin is you know, those that maybe are in classical music, like, like I was usually think of some of his pieces as like romantic and, but he has some beast of some etudes that are like super majestic and very difficult. So one of the etudes in there, I think it was uh, op opus, op one of the opus 10 ones, because he has different opuses, opus 10 number five or whatnot, but, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I have that perfume or cologne rather, opus 10, is that possible? Actually, no? Yeah, there is, isn't no, there? I think but it you're should right. Be. There is like a, there <laughs> should be. If there's not, I feel like that does sound familiar. And I just want to put a real quick comment. You guys are, you know, obviously both very accomplished stage performers and and whether it be in music, well, both are in music, of course. I, you know, and and I, I give a lot to you guys. For, I did not win a beauty contest though, PJ, well, I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I would. Did I? Um, I think you're beautiful, Tao, for the rest. Well, that's so kind. I mean, on the inside, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just, 
want you to know though that I have never, um, you know, I've performed as well. I've never uh, really had to feel like I was, uh, you know, mean to myself for hitting a wrong note or for for being out of tune because um, my my talent is I'm an excellent air guitarist. So oh. that, that's what an I air guitarist. Yes, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Bring me metal. I'm a very good air drummer. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a very good I mean, air everything. <laughs> yes. Oh, sure. Outdo us, Leslie. Of course. <laughs> Our guest today was the wonderful Leslie Hunter. Uh, she's an entrepreneur and influencer. Uh, she is the president of Resume Makeover, which is a great company. Leslie, where can people find Resume Makeover if they need help with their resume? Absolutely. Well, you can check out uh, my website, which is business website, which is www.resumemakeover.com. Um, also I'm on LinkedIn, you know, for anyone that wants to find me, Leslie, L-E-S-L-E-Y Hunter, I know you guys have my name there, but Leslie Hunter. And, um, yeah, I would say, or shoot me an email at Leslie at resume makeover.com, but my website or find me on LinkedIn are, are the easiest. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, she is, uh, uh, a woman of many talents as we heard today. Not quite as talented as PJ with his uh, air, air guitar. guitar. No one, <laughs> um, but but she'll get there. She'll get I will. there. I'm sure one she day, will. one day. <laughs> Leslie, it was a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much for joining us on the Better Business Pod broadcast. Podcast, <laughs> and uh, to all of our listeners, keep braving it, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much, guys. It was a pleasure to be here. Truly.